When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamil, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thedius rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400 joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Good morning, happy Father's Day. My name is Pastor Justin and I'm the lead pastor here at New Heights Church. And I've been out of the pulpit for two weeks. So I am pretty excited to be back today. In fact, when I was in Israel on Sunday, uh, I was telling Liz, man, I feel like I should be preaching that at one stop we had a bathroom break and I found a poor Israeli who spoke English and I, <laughs> I preached to him. So he was already saved and already a Christian. At the end of it, he said, hey, I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus. And I said, it's okay, I'm a pastor and I just miss preaching. So I said, give me about 40 more minutes and we'll make it through our text. <laughs> Man, it's good to be back. It is good to be back. If you're new here or joining online, New Heights Church is dedicated to doctrine. That's one of our core values. And we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book, and we are currently in the book of Acts, and we find ourselves today in chapter 5, looking at verses 33 through 42, what Pastor Stu just read, and as you are making your way there in your Bible, I hope you have your Bibles today, as you're making your way there, I want to share with you something that I learned this week while preparing for this, this message. So right before the start of World War II, Allied forces were terrified of having a repeat uh, of the mustard gas attacks that uh, solidified World War I as one of the worst conflicts in history. Tens, and thousands, or tens of thousands of people died from mustard gas exposure. It was a long, excruciating death process, and the Allied forces wanted to develop an antidote in case this type of chemical warfare were to happen again. Two doctors, two doctors uh, at Yale University, Lewis Goodman and Alfred Gilman, started studying soldiers who were affected by mustard gas. And they noticed that many of them had a surprisingly low number of immune cells in their blood. Uh, these are cells that if, if they are mutated, they could go on to develop into leukemia, lymphoma. And so they, hype, they, they guessed that if the mustard gas could destroy normal white blood cells, it seemed likely that it could also destroy cancerous ones. So they began to test this. And after a few successful animal trials, it was time to find a human volunteer. Now remember, this is mustard gas and people are still really aware of what this chemical agent did in 1917, but they did eventually find a volunteer. His name was, uh, he's, he's only known as JD, and he had massive tumors uh, in his lymph nodes. So he couldn't even fold his arms across his chest. The tumors were so large, he was unable to do anything like that. And at 10 a.m. on August 27th, 1942, JD was given the first injection of nitrogen mustard, the same compound used to make mustard gas. And after a few treatments, the tumors began to shrink. And with each injection, he became a little better. All of a sudden, he could sleep, he could swallow, he could eat. The pain started going away, the pain was fading. 
This was mon a monumental discovery in medical history. This was the beginning of what we know today as chemotherapy. Now, here's the catch, and many of you know this firsthand. Chemotherapy not only kills the cancerous cells, it also kills healthy cells that rapidly uh, mutate, such as those in the bone marrow, hair follicles, and the, di the digestive tract. So that makes the side effects of chemo treatment pretty daunting for a lot of people. You're talking about anemia infections, hair loss, severe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, I've told you that my father had a brain tumor and he went through chemotherapy and that was just, it was brutal for him, the side effects. And even though chemo is designed to save your life, it, it comes at a great cost with its side effects. Of course, chemotherapy, we can't guarantee that it'll save everyone. Um, but we know that you, you'll experience uh, very little or perhaps you'll have a really, really difficult time with it. So it just depends on the person. I've known people that have had chemotherapy that have come through really well. And then, of course, I know people who, like my dad, suffered through chemotherapy terribly. Um, it just depends. There's, there's no rhyme or reason to how a person's going to react. And because of that, many people choose not to have the treatment, essentially guaranteeing that they're going to die from the cancer. Now, here's something that's equally heartbreaking. Faith in Jesus 100% saves you from eternity. Guaranteed, sealed, and delivered upon death. But that same saving faith in Jesus, perfectly designed and intended as the only agent that can save your soul, comes at a potential extreme risk to your physical health presently. Now keep following me. And what I mean by this is that we've, we have been studying through Acts up to this point, we're in chapter five, and we're beginning to see the risk that's associated with being a follower of Jesus. Not a real popular message all the time to preach. Nonetheless, it's very scriptural. We've seen the disciples arrested, brought before the high priest, released, arrested again, miraculously freed, brought back to the council, and this, this theme of suffering for the name is going to continue throughout the rest of this book and throughout church history. And many, many people reject Jesus because they feel it's safer to do that than to become one of his followers. You might be asking, man, Pastor Justin, what kind of follower are we talking about that carries with it this kind of risk? Because I don't want to be that kind of follower. Well, honestly, I'm talking about the only kind of follower that Jesus saves us to be. The Bible only shows us one kind, the kind of disciple uh, and, and that's what we're seeing emerge here in Acts. That's what we're seeing emerge here in our text. And actually, here it is. If you, if you want a big idea, the big theme for today's sermon, in one statement that personifies the type of disciple that you and I are saved to be, be. and if you're a note taker, and I hope you are, write this down or type it into your phone or take a picture of it on the screen, whatever you do, do these days. But here it is. Are you ready? When Jesus saves you, Jesus saves you to be a dangerous and daring disciple. I got a few amens out of that. When, when Jesus saves you, Jesus saves you to be a dangerous and daring disciple. This is the standard. This is the benchmark. And I know it's completely countercultural. But anything less than this is simply playing it safe. And playing it safe is absolutely not the mark of a disciple that Jesus saves you to be. Listen to what Jesus says about someone who wants to be saved, someone who wants to be a Christ follower. This is what Jesus demands of those who want to follow him. He said, take up your cross and die to self. He says, you want to be a follower of me? Narrow is the gate and hard is the way. Oh, you want to be a disciple of mine in Cincinnati? Love the ones that you hate. <laughs> You want to be, be sons and daughters of God, eat my flesh and drink my blood. You want to claim Christ, be hot or be cold, because being indifferent is the road that leads to hell. To be a disciple of Jesus, he says, you got to lose your life to save it. Now with that being said, <laughs> as my introduction, let's look at chapter 5, let's unpack this a little bit, and I want to look at these daring disciples because I want us to see what they knew what they, they knew, what we know, because what they know impacts their everyday life and what, what I want your everyday faith to be impacted by today's message. This is God's word and it's for you. You apply these truths to your life today, your life can literally experience transformation. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much and we thank you for the grace of God that has been shown to us. The unmerited, undeserved, lavish favor that comes from your hand and has been experienced in our own life. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what lessons you have for us as we study the book of Acts, this incredible history of the early church written by Luke, and that we would, we would see just how much you have loved us to establish a relationship with us, to call, to call us to be a part of your church and be on, be on board with your mission. So we pray that you would strengthen us as we as a church study this, this portion of scripture today, and we thank you, Father, for those who are not only here with us in person, but those who are tuning in online from so many different places uh, in the country and the world through our media outlets uh, that have been made possible from technology today. We thank you for all that are here with us today. Again, we thank you for them, and we pray, Lord, that this, is, that this time together would be enriching, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... I'm going to look at three things that these early disciples knew in their own life that changed the way they lived. The first one is found in verse 33 through 35. Uh, real disciples, a real disciple knows the message is divisive. Look with me real quick at Acts chapter, or, or verse 33 through 35. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. Okay, if you're just joining us, you need to know this. The last two weeks we've been in the middle of this narrative. The apostles have been dragged before the Sanhedrin again. Peter preached a message at ticked off a lot of people. Did you know sometimes God's word does that? I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes, sometimes God's word really upsets people. Um, anyway, Peter did that in verses, the verses just before this. Uh, in a nutshell, here's what he said. Number one, they in some way were responsible for Jesus' execution. Not just them, but all of us for our sin. But Jesus calls out their sin and says, because of your sin, Jesus died on the cross. Number two, there's salvation and forgiveness available if they're interested. Pastor Enos did an incredible job last week of talking about how God's grace is for everyone. It doesn't matter what. You, there, there's nothing that you can do that's, too, too grievous for the Lord to forgive. And number three, he, Peter's preaching that the Holy Spirit is present, and not only present, but he's affirming the reality that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, I need you to grasp this situation that we're reading. You have the highest Jewish authorities assembled who are supposed to be the legislative-like body where the law is considered, it's reflected upon. And, and I think for us to really get the gravity of this situation, I need you just to think, if you combined our Congress with our Supreme Court, but rather than being calm and rational, well, I can't say that, they're always rational, but rather than being calm and rational, these men are so furious, they're so enraged, they wanted to murder them right in the very halls that they were standing in. That is the situation we find ourselves in today in the text. And that to me is crazy. Here's why. We read, about, we read this, it's, it's a story that's familiar to us, but this is, this is really crazy what's happening here. This anger, this this. Uh, this hostility that the disciples or the apostles are experiencing. It's crazy because what in the world have these guys done to encourage that kind of wrath? They're not thieves. They're not murderers. They're not calling on people to form a militia. So why? What, what law had they broken that was so bad that the Sanhedrin determined that they should probably just be put to death? And don't neglect this powerful tr truth. Don't just read by this without thinking about this and grasping it, understanding it. What we're seeing in this text is just how divisive the gospel is. That the very mention of Jesus brings this tone of violence into the hearts and the minds of the Sanhedrin. And here, here's what they were doing. You want to know what got them so upset? All that they were doing was teaching and preaching salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. That's ticked off the Sanhedrin so much that now they're, they're wanting to kill these apostles. See, make no mistake, listen to me, Christianity is an intolerant religion. Intolerant to other gods, intolerant to any other way of salvation but faith alone in Jesus Christ. Christianity is exclusive and because of that the gospel is divisive. And what I find interesting here is how pe different people respond differently to conviction. When Peter Think about this. Some repent and some want to kill those who spoke the words that brought conviction. We preach God's word. Sometimes it, it resonates. That seed's planted and somebody responds to the gospel. Other times people get upset, right? Different people react differently to conviction. When Peter repented, he, he went out and wept bitterly. 
when Judas repented, he went out and hung himself. Later on, we're going to read in chapter 7, when Stephen preaches to this same council, they, they respond. Look at in Acts chapter 7, verse 57 through 58, it says, But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, that same man later, who's, who does respond to conviction, he's preaching. Acts chapter 9, verse 22 through 23. He's preaching to the Jews from the porch of the fortress of Antonio. And the people began to riot, and we read this. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. I think human nature hates conviction. Society right now wants to remove all taboos. Why? Well, then we can, we can commit almost any kind of action we want, and we don't have to feel guilty about it. Today, anything goes, right? I've heard anything goes as long as there are two consenting adults. That's what I've heard. Society wants to remove any sort of feelings of guilt. Do whatever you want to do as long as it makes you happy. Do whatever you want to do as long as it gives you pleasure. Am I wrong? Or is that the world we live in today, right? And different people respond differently to conviction. Remember that as you, that as you witness. Remember that as you share. Not everybody's going to respond to the gospel with conviction. It's going to upset people. And I'm not telling you to go out and upset people. That's not your job. Your job is just to preach God's message and you're to do it in love. But you just need to know no matter how loving you are, sometimes people aren't going to respond with conviction. Sometimes people are going to respond upset and angry. It's not even your job to necessarily call out somebody's sin in their own life. You can let the Holy Spirit do that. Your job is just to preach the word. I think sometimes Christians get confused. Our job, we feel like it's our job to be the Holy Spirit. We're going to go tell, tell people all the sins that they're doing and everything in their life that's wrong. Your job's just to preach the gospel. Your job's just to preach the word of God, and the Holy Spirit will do the conviction. But I'm just warning you that not everybody's going to like the gospel. All right? I don't think, I don't think the disciples should have, been, should have been surprised by this reaction because they kind of after all were warned about it by Jesus in John 15 18 he says if the world hates you know that it hated me before it hated you Matthew 10 22 it says and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but the one who endures to the end will be saved this makes a really good youth camp message right here <laughs> Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I'm going to keep going here. Mark 13, 9, be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Again, Luke 6, 22, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn you, your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. One last message for you, John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The disciples are not surprised by this reaction. They were warned about it. They were prepared for it. Jesus clearly teaches us that some are going to hate us. He also taught us that some won't hate us, but they're going to turn to Jesus and join us. But, but if we're students of God's word, we can conclude that hatred is going to be widespread, general response to Christian evangelism. People do not want to hear that they need a savior. And that will hold true wherever you go amongst the nations. We see this in our world today. Liz and I lived as missionaries for 10 years with the Assemblies of God. We lived in nations where you could lose your life for preaching the gospel. Okay, We're, we're thrilled to be in America today. We're thankful for our nation. I know sometimes woe is me and we talk about how bad America's getting. But the truth is we are all here today gathered and we have the freedom to do that and celebrate Jesus. And I'm not saying it's going to last forever but I'm going to be thankful for it. As long as we've got the freedom to do it, I am thankful for it and thankful for America. <laughs> Ravi, Ravi Zacharias said, anytime you make a truth claim, you mean something contrary to its false. Truth excludes its opposite. 
So when you start to boldly live out your faith in front of your family, in front of your friends, in front of your coworkers, or your classmates, or your neighbors, do not be shocked when they give you the cold shoulder. Don't be shocked when they talk about you behind your back or even to your face. Don't be shocked and don't be afraid. You know, I love Buddy Young. Uh, some of you guys might not know who this is. He used to play in the NFL and he was a little guy, five foot five. So now you know why I like him. <laughs> and his, he had a motto and it was this. It's not the size of the man in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the man. My dad used to quote this to me all the time. No, no spiritual connection. He would just quote this to me all the time because I was little. My brother, who grew to be six foot, and to most of you, that's not tall, but in, a, in the Hanson family, that's a giant, man. You're six foot. You're towering over everyone. So my dad used to quote that all the time. It's not the size of the man in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the man. Now, I took that quote into the recess field when I got in a fight. That quote was bogus. <laughs> A lot of times it is the size of the man. But spiritually, it's not the size of the man in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the man. He would also say this, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. He was right. Resistance is only an opportunity. That's all. It's an opportunity for persistence. Proverbs 28.1 says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Do you know lions have no natural enemies? They're the king of the beast. No animals attack lions. They're bold, they're fierce, they have no natural enemies, and nobody can conquer the lion. They're the king of the jungle. So the definition of a Christian right out of Proverbs 28, that's powerful. Because the Christian or the righteous is as bold as a lion. What do we have to fear? Resistance, listen to me church, resistance and persecution is only the path to victory. See, it's not the end of the road. It's the path to victory. So you accept it, you push right through, you keep going, you don't worry about it. The battle is only an opportunity. A real disciple knows that the message they live for and they speak of is divisive. And they also know that, and we see this in verse 36 through 40, the message cannot be stopped. The message cannot be stopped. Stopped. Gamaliel is, he's a wise man. He's trying to choose his words very wisely here. Read with me in 36 through 40. It says, For before these days, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. This is my favorite verse. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Gamaliel is walking a fine line here. He's, he's trying to use some political savvy to navigate this, this really interesting situation he finds himself in. What he says is interesting, too, because he gives a couple examples from history that everybody in that time would have known. Now, we read it. They're just names. We don't know who they are. But these were well-known figures in that time, and these, his audience would have definitely known who they were. Gamaliel, he's, he's interesting. He's a Pharisee. He was the grandson of the esteemed Hillel, the founder of Israel's strongest school of religion. He was given the title Rabban, uh, which means our teacher, and it's kind of like a step above the title Rabbi, which means my teacher. In fact, the Mishnah, the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions that we know today as the Oral Torah, uh, wrote of Gamaliel this. It says, Since Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, died, there has been no more reverence for the law, and purity and abstinence died out at the same time. Now, Gamaliel, he was a Pharisee, and even though the Sadducees had more political power, we know that because of Acts chapter 5, verse 17, it was politically foolish for the Sadducees to ask the Romans to execute the apostles without support from the Pharisees. All right, so a lot of, a lot of, Gamaliel says that this, this, Theodos rose up. Stu said, why do I have to read today? You got two weird names in there. I said, Stu, every week I got to read names wrong, and I'm sure I get them wrong. The only guy in our audience would probably be Dr. Adrian Rosen, who knows what I'm saying the name is wrong. So, uh, Stu, you did awesome wherever you're at. So we'll, we'll call him Theodos for right now. He, he, he rose up. He mentions this guy. 
who shows up. A lot of people got excited. They started following. Then he gets killed after some time and all his followers went away. Then another guy he mentions, Judas, the Galilean, he comes on the scene. He gets a lot of people fired up. He gathers a following too, but he's killed. The same thing. After some time, all of his followers go away. And he argues that if Jesus is fake, he's already been killed. Let's just wait around and eventually these disciples, they're going to lose their motivation and they're going to scatter just like all the others did. No harm, no foul, no need in trying to kill a dead horse, right? But what he says next, now I believe truly shows why this man was so revered and so respected. Because what he does is he employs some big picture reasoning when he says this. If this plan or this work is of human origin, it's going to fail. But if it's from God, you won't be able to overthrow them. Now... Don't misquote me. I understand that he's, a, he's skeptical here. But it also seems as though he's at least willing. He's at least willing to acknowledge that their God might be behind all of this. Now, I'm not going to impose anything on this text that's not here. So I want to make it really clear that I'm not sure if he actually believes that. I don't know if Gamaliel actually believes this. But he allows that. Maybe just, just maybe God's doing something here. And if that's the case, it would be futile to think you can stop something God was doing. He is thinking about the God that led Moses, that led Joshua and all the judges and David. He says, he says more here than he probably ever realized. That when God is doing something, you can fight against it all you want, but you aren't going to stop it. Quit fighting against God because you aren't going to beat him. Verse 39 says that they, they took his advice. They took his advice, and some translations say they were persuaded by him. But then in verse 40, the apostles get this beat down. They get a smack down, WWE style, okay? And they're told not to do this again before letting him go. Now, this is confusing to me because, I mean, I thought they were persuaded by Gamaliel. I thought they believed him. They, they decided to, yep, he's got good advice. Then immediately after that, they get a beat down. I mean, if they took his advice, I'd think they wouldn't need the, to beat the apostles up. They wouldn't need to teach the apostles a lesson, right? But this shows just how angry they were. Because if this is what they took, this is what they took his advice look like, can you imagine <laughs> what they really wanted to do to him? Think about it. Now, I want to level with you for a second today, okay? These apostles took a beating. This wasn't, the, and I know there's some tough guys in here. We got some really tough guys at New Heights Church, uh, a lot of fellows in here that probably can take a punch. This wasn't that kind of beating. Okay, a flogging would have been 39 lashes with whips braided with bone, iron balls, and sometimes shards of metal designed to tear your flesh all the way to the bone. This is what took place with the, the apostles here. And we're talking about severe blood loss. We're talking about body trauma, excruciating pain. And it wasn't uncommon at all for men to die from this. In fact, I just got back from Israel and, and our guide talked about this. When Pilate uh, orders Jesus to experience this, he was hoping Jesus would die. Because nine out of ten times, these men did die from these beatings. And then Pilate wouldn't have been held responsible. And he could kind of have just said, whoops, oh, we took it a little too far. Not his response. He did not want to be the guy that had to condemn Jesus to death. So he was hoping that the flogging would do that, that Jesus would die. But we know the story, Jesus didn't die. Well, here are these apostles, they're getting the same thing that happened to Jesus, and they don't die. They make it through. They're supposed to die, but they don't die. Okay, so they won't kill them, but they're going to beat them up so bad and hope that this is going to stop them, that this is going to scare them. But, and I, I, you need to know this. Listen to me. The devil's still in the same business that he was in over 2,000 years ago. He's still trying to bully and intimidate Christians today. He's still trying to intimidate us, scare us, and get us to stop preaching God's word, to stop sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the only way to grace and mercy and to heaven. They were, they were trying to stop something that was completely unstoppable. <laughs> Gamaliel was right. If God was really behind this Jesus movement, then it doesn't matter if they killed these apostles or not. You're not stopping the ball once God kicks it down the hill. Let me, let me just share this with you because I have been with, with, with Christians overseas who have made the ultimate sacrifice for following Jesus and his kingdom. It's one of my favorite quotes when they, when they would say that you can't stop the ball once God kicks it down the hill. God is gonna fulfill his purpose. They can take my life. They can imprison me. They can torture me. God is not gonna stop fulfilling his mission. He's gonna do what he says he's gonna do. Okay? 
Now, can we stop for a moment? Can we just soak that in? Here we are today meeting at New Heights Church in this beautiful building on this morning in 2023. And it's a continuation of the exact scenario laid out before us in this text. Think about it. Christianity is the biggest thing in the history of the world. We're still talking about Jesus. Nothing can stop the church because it's of God. That's why he says, but if it's of God, if it's not of God, it's going to self-destruct. It's going to go away, so don't worry about it. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't preach about Jesus. Don't teach about Jesus. And it says the leaders, they released him, and they, they sure aren't running away from the prison here. It's not what they're going to do. Now, they're probably limping away from the flogging. The flesh on their backs probably still torn up. That means they're bleeding. They're exhausted. They're probably a bit shook up. They probably look like something out of a scary movie. And what do they do? They drag themselves into the temple. I want you to think about this, what I just told you. The, the kind of beating that these men just took and they dragged themselves to the temple. If there was ever any excuse not to go to the temple, I think they had it. And today we make up all kinds of excuses not to come into the house of God on Sunday. It's raining outside. It's too hot. I've got family in town. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not getting down on any, I'm guilty of the same thing. I'm preaching to myself here. The Reds are on TV. The Bengals are playing. These guys just took the, the biggest beating of their life and they dragged themselves to church. Think about it. Now, they probably were like, look, they probably walked in. Sorry I'm late. Sorry I look like this. <laughs> but boy, do I got a story to tell. Sorry I'm staining the carpet. Uh, but I got a story to tell you. Jesus loves you. Jesus took a beating for you. And here's what I want you to know, New Heights Church. Sometimes you're going to need to take a beating for him. I know that's not a popular thing to preach right now, but it's all throughout our Bible. Jesus took a beating for you. Sometimes you're going to have to take a beating for him. Okay? It's a hard truth. Too many believers are so ill-equipped and ill-prepared for what is truly the Christian life. Because we care way more about filling the seats. We care way more about having people respond to the altar that we got to candy coat it. We got we to tell them something they would like, something they want to hear, something they're going to accept. So I can report to headquarters all the people that said yes to Jesus, all the people that came to our church. Here's the truth, though. The church has, has literally not prepared people for the real Christian life. Because Jesus took a beating for you, and sometimes following him means taking a beating for him. That's absolutely true, but it's, it's not like the, it's something they don't always tell you in sermons, right? Hey, you might get treated like Jesus got treated. I want you to know, in that, in that day in certain parts of the world today, they beat people up physically for following Jesus still. Liz knows people, even from El Salvador, who have went and served as missionaries and who have lost their lives because of where they went. And like I said, thankfully, we're not here yet in America, but you, you and I still face people not liking us. We get beat up in a different way. And I, I, at this point, I'd much rather take this kind of beating than I would a flogging, if I'm going to be real honest with you. Okay, I'd rather people bully me on social media. I'd rather get ostracized. I'd rather have that than to take the flogging. But we get beat up too, right? We still face people not liking us. And so we, we, we might lose our reputation. We might lose social capital. We might lose friends. We might lose a job. You pay a price when you come to Jesus. You just do. In New Heights Church, we're going to have to pay a price. He paid the ultimate price. We are going to have to pay a price to walk with him. We're going to have to pay a price to be witnesses to him so that others can meet him and be saved and served by him. My goal as your pastor for you is not comfort and ease. <laughs> Our goal at New Heights Church is to be witnesses. Jesus took a beating for us, and sometimes we're going to have to take a beating for him. So they beat the disciples. They give, they give the illusion that they leave, uh, leave it in the hands of God, but ultimately they beat the disciples to, to scare them. 
And I want you to know something today. You and I are still a part of the same movement that the apostles were a part of then. The message today is as divisive as it was then. The message is unstoppable today as it was then. And because of those truths, we get to this last point that the real disciple know, a real disciple knows they cannot stop proclaiming God's message. This is our last point. This is my favorite, okay? Listen to how these men left Gamaliel and the rest of the Sanhedrin. Our verses 41 through 42, it says, Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing. <laughs> they just took a, the beating of a lifetime, and yet they, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. <laughs> you know what? This, this last part, it, it amazes me. Honestly, usually we read through this, the book of Acts and other parts of the Bible, and it's hard to really, truly understand what we're reading. It's a story we've heard over and over. Sometimes we need to just pause and we need to think about the events that are taking place in this text. Now, I've never been beaten. I've never taken a beating for Jesus yet. Like I said, I've been bullied a few times. I've been picked on. I, I've, I've stayed in a holding cell overseas, not even overnight. <laughs> never, never experienced anything like this. So I'm not going to pretend I understand it because I don't. That would be bogus. But I can be realistic with you today and tell you that if I were to be flogged, praising and rejoicing just doesn't immediately come to my mind of ways that I would respond. I'm going to be real honest. I, I don't know if I'd be singing, <laughs> great is thy faithfulness, after taking a flogging. Yet the apostles' response shows us how, how these guys were so legit. They were into this. They were fully bought in. They fully believe this matter more than their own lives, their own comfort, their own well-being. And there's a question that has to be asked here. Something happened in between verses 39 and 40. What prepared these guys to take that kind of beating? What enables somebody to endure that level of torture and humil humiliation and still, still be able to rejoice? I mean, what in the world? And here it is. When Jesus miraculously saves you, the overflowing joy of salvation and the power of the Holy Spirit allows you to boldly face whatever this world may try to do to stop you from proclaiming Jesus Christ as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, one true God who died and rose again to conquer death and has made all things new. The disciples faced the worst thing mankind could do to them, death. That's what they were trying to do at least. But verse 40 tells us that, 42 tells us that they, they taught everywhere and every day. It didn't stop them. Doesn't sound like they allowed the threats to scare them. They taught, they taught large groups, small groups, public groups, private groups. They taught any and all who would listen. They did not stop at all. Real disciples of Jesus, they're daring and they're bold. The wounds from their flogging haven't even healed yet and they were right back at it for God's glory and for their own. So let's take a hard look today. This is what I want you to do. Take a hard look in the mirror for the last few minutes of this, this sermon today. How would you measure up if I brought out a measuring tape that identified what kind of dangerous and daring disciple you currently are, what would it say about your own life? Okay? Now, I love to give you books that I recommend, and I'm going to do that this, this morning. I totally recommend the book Insanity of God written by Nick Ripken. Such an amazing book. It shares all kinds of stories about how God moved in some of the most difficult places and difficult situations. They were missionaries overseas in a very difficult country. And he's just really raw in this book. He's real transparent. He talks about his struggles. He talks about how it was difficult at, at times. to, fig to he, he really had to ask the question, is God enough in difficult times? It's God enough. That's a legitimate question. And, I, and, and obviously, you know, he comes to the conclusion that God is more than enough. But you've got to read this book. So The Insanity of God, written by Nick Ripkin. He, he tells this part of the story where he was having a talk with someone from China. And, and they were talking about the persecuted church. And I want to read this part from the book. It says, he, he said this, The communists in China were not concerned with what Christians believed. What they cared about was political allegiance, and they understood clearly the threat from those who declared the lordship of Christ, a lordship that would not be shared with the state or with any other power. So I asked whether, when, and how the oppressed could truly threaten an oppressor. 
they offered this scenario in response. They said, the security police regularly harass a believer who owns, a, owns the property where a house church meets. The, people, the police say, you have got to stop these meetings. If you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and we will throw you out into the street. Then the property owner will probably respond, do you want my house? Do you want my farm? Well, if you do, then you need to talk to Jesus because I gave this property to him. The security police will not really know what to make of that answer, so they will say, we don't have any way to get to Jesus, but we can certainly get to you. When we take your property, you and your family will have nowhere to live. And the house church believers will declare, then we will be free to trust God for shelter as well as for our daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you, the persecutors will then tell them then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing, the believers will respond. And then we will put you in prison, the police will threaten. Now, of course, by now, the believer's response is almost predictable, right? They say, then we will be free to preach the good news to Jesus, to the captives, to set them free. We will be free to plant churches in prison. They say, if you try to do that, then we will kill you. They're frustrated at this point. And with utter consistency, the house church believers will reply, then we will be free to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. Now I want to ask, I want to ask you something today. Is, is the resurrection power that the New Testament describes still real and available to believers in our world today? Because Liz and I, we've met believers all over the world who live in some of the most difficult situations and circumstances, and they will say absolutely yes. One of my favorite stories, favorite person that I've ever met, I'm so glad that our paths crossed, was a Pakistani man in the country of Thailand. Liz and I were serving as international pastors, and these were refugees coming from Pakistan, and this certain individual, this brother, eventually got arrested because he didn't have the right paperwork. Now, he was, he was shot at his family. They made an attempt to kill him because his family, they were Christians in Pakistan, so they had to flee. They didn't get the proper paperwork. He ends up in, in it's like a jail. It's this horrible conditions. And Liz and I, we would go visit these people in these conditions. We had to stand about 10 feet from them. There were two fences, and we had to talk through a fence. And you can imagine about 100 people lined up on this fence, all screaming. So it was really difficult to hear. And the first time I went, I really, really struggled. Here, Liz and I, Americans, we come from one of the most blessed, nicest countries in the world, and we're serving as missionaries overseas, and there's nothing I can do for this person, but just tell him I'm praying for you. That's it. And I struggle. I told this, I don't even want to go because I just don't feel comfortable with this. I hate this. We're going to leave. We're going to go back to our nice house. And he's stuck in these conditions. And she said, he wants you to come visit. He keeps asking, go visit. So I'd go visit him. Go visit him. He seemed a little down in the beginning. He missed his family. He missed his wife. He missed his kids. And I remember he said, can you get me a a Bible in Urdu. I said, yeah, I can try. So I got a hold of Fire Bible, and we got a Fire Bible, Urdu Fire Bible, and I gave it to him. And and I just remember I would reach my hand through the fence and just put it towards him, and I'd pray with him, and I'd get in, and I'd leave, and a week later went back to visit him. This time there was a difference, just something in his countenance. And and he he said, Pastor Justin, because I said one thing to him at the end. I, I said, hey, I didn't even feel right saying it, but I said, hey, do me one favor, Brother, can you think of why, what God wants you to do in here? After I said it, I told Liz, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Because, again, I just felt so bad saying that. Easy for me to say. I'm going to go have my noodles and sit in my air-conditioned apartment. And I just told him, what what is God trying to do? So I came back, and this time there was a difference. And he said, all he he kept yelling, I need more Bibles. Trying to hear him. I'm looking at my friend who's with me. I said, did he just say he needs more Bibles? Yeah, I think that's what he said. We couldn't hear him because there were so many people this, this day, particular day. So finally he finds some piece of paper and he writes. He says, I need more Urdu Bibles. I go, okay. I, okay. I said, I gave him the thumbs up. And then he flipped it on the other side. He said, I planted a church. <laughs> it's a true story. So we go back. We're getting all kinds of Bibles we can. We're visiting him every week. We're encouraging him. And, and his, his church is growing. 
eventually when we come and we're visiting him, they're not even coming up to the line because they're sitting there and he's got his Bible and you could see this whole crowd. And he'll look at me and give me a thumbs up and he'll wave me off and tell me he'll visit me next week because he's in the middle of making disciples in the worst possible conditions. And I'll never, ever forget it. They eventually let him out. We've been praying and praying. We didn't get paperwork, couldn't get paperwork. And I went up and I asked the guard when we went to pick him up. I said, why is he being let out? To, why is he being let out? And the guard just looks at me and goes, oh, it's time. <laughs> I was driving him home. There was a part of him that says, I, I feel like I can't leave my church. I said, well, we'll keep visiting him. And I said, can I ask you, can I ask you something, uh, what kept you going? Kept you going in there. Oh, Brother Justin, you should know. <laughs> I've experienced the power of the resurrected Jesus. And nothing can take my joy away. I have the answer. He's still there causing all kinds of problems. That's why I won't say his name today from the pulpit. He knew the resurrection power. He had personally experienced it for himself, and he could not shut up when it came to talking about Jesus. You know what I love about verse 42? I love this last line. They did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. They didn't care where they were. They were going to preach and teach Jesus. Whether they were in a small group or a big group, whether they were talking uh, to people on the street, it didn't matter, they were going to talk Jesus. And I want you to hear something. Jesus was controversial back then when the disciples talked about him, and he's controversial today when we talk about him. Why are these people so controversial? Here's why. Because Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way. And listen to me, it's not like we came up with this. We didn't invent this claim. This is Jesus himself. He's, he's, he, he made the claim. We're merely relating his claim and the claim that all the writers of the New Testament made. In fact, John 14, 6, Jesus said this, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Acts 4, 12, the apostle Peter echoed these words when he said, and there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul teaches the same thing in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, that man Christ Jesus. In fact, this is the entire testimony of the New Testament that no one can know the Father except through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, New Heights Church, listen to me. We can't stop talking about Jesus. We exist to be witnesses of him. And the Holy Spirit wants to empower you. He wants to empower me, wants to empower us to be witnesses who always, always, no matter what, proclaim that Jesus is alive. He forgives sins. He saves people. He saved me. And he changed my life. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to proclaim that message. Message. He changed the lives of the early disciples. Jesus did that and can still do that. <laughs> He loves you and you need Jesus. You can't experience salvation outside of Jesus Christ. If you're here today or joining us online and you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus. You might even be very moral. You might even be a real religious person. Some might even say you're very spiritual. But if you don't have Jesus, you can't experience salvation. Jesus is the only way. The only way. And I'm not trying to recruit you today to morality or spirituality today. What I'm doing today is inviting you to know Jesus. Now, I prayed over this sermon. I prayed that those who have not yet will turn from sin and trust in Jesus. I'm inviting you to cross the line over to Team Jesus and go public with your faith. That's what I'm inviting you to do today. For those of us who are believers, you need to know this, that this life comes with a price. Okay? That there is opposition. There is ostracism, persecution that comes against those who would make much of the name of Jesus. But I'll tell you what, what a great joy. What a great honor. What a privilege it is to be counted worthy of being opposed because of Jesus. Jesus paid a price for us and we will pay a price for following him. And I want everyone who calls New Heights Church, their church, to make their life count for the name of Jesus. Listen, we all got lives to live. You're going to live your life for some, something. You're going to live your life for some cause, for some purpose. Make it Jesus. Make it the name of Jesus. Will you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?
I can't close today. I know that this is church and most people who come to church are already following Jesus, but I cannot close this, this service today without giving an opportunity. I know I just painted a unique picture of following Jesus. I pretty much just said, you say yes to Jesus, persecution is coming your way. But you say yes to Jesus, you experience real life. It's life. this world has nothing to offer you. Jesus has come to offer you real life, real life. So if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior, maybe you've even raised your hand before at youth camp or at a church service, you did it out of emotion. You said, yep, I'll raise my hand to do that. But you have never truly surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I wanna give you the opportunity today to do that. All you gotta do is raise your hand. If I see your hand, I just wanna know who you are so I can pray with you. If you never accepted Jesus as your personal savior, you have the chance to do that today. If you're listening online and you've never done that, obviously you can't raise your hand and I can't make eye contact with you but Jesus knows where you're at. doesn't matter where you are, you can make that decision. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I am a sinner who needs you. I confess my sin to you. I believe that you are who you say you are, and I surrender my life to you. That's it. That's all you got to do. Now for the rest of those, there's a lot of them because we didn't have a whole lot of hands go up today. That means you are following Jesus. Today I want you to recommit to the plan and the purpose of God. Sometimes we gotta be a lot more loud about our faith. God has put people in our life and in our path who do not know him, that need to know him, and we're the mouthpiece. So today I'm gonna pray boldness over you, that you would be a bold, daring, and dangerous disciple and follower of Jesus. God, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for what you're doing for all those that call New Heights Church their home church. Now I pray uh, a prayer over every single life that has surrendered to you. That you would empower them through the Holy Spirit to be bold and daring. God, give them a boldness to face any kind of fear that they have, anything that would stop them. And I pray your Holy Spirit would empower them to go be a mouthpiece for Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name.